They needed a prison for the most dangerous man in the world. Napoleon had seized supreme power in France. He'd marched his armies from Portugal to Moscow. He'd put the fear in the heart of every anointed king and emperor in Europe. But now he was a prisoner. His captors needed a prison from which escape was unthinkable. Their answer lay in the South Atlantic, a scrap of land a thousand miles from the African coast, St. Helena. Napoleon and his staff crowded onto the quarter deck to get a glimpse of their new home. They were military men. They knew there would be no possibility of rescue, no possibility of escape. They were here for good. I've travelled to the Mid-Atlantic Ocean to find out more about St. Helena's rich and at times difficult history. I want to know how this tiny island became another pawn in the great game of maritime supremacy. Why it played such a pivotal role in the transatlantic slave trade. And to hear a story of liberated African slaves who found freedom but never their way home. But first, I want to discover more about the island's most famous former resident, Napoleon Bonaparte. He arrived in 1815 and the British took no chances with their prisoner. They even sent an entire garrison to the neighbouring Ascension Island to discourage the French from any thoughts of a rescue. When he did eventually come ashore, Napoleon demanded that it was at this time of day, it was at dusk. He didn't want the local population watching him in the full glare of daylight. He landed just over there on the eastern side of the bay. He made his way to the land. He walked up through here, entered the great bastion that guarded uh, Jamestown from the sea and made his way into the castle. There was a huge crowd of St. Helenians, about 400 people watching him come ashore. They were fascinated to see this man that would be the new most famous resident on the island. And for once, a witness said, there was no noise at all, no chattering, no talking. And for once, you could hear the noise of the waves crashing on the beach, and that was it. They watched as Napoleon walked up through and into this main street for his first night on the island. St Helena's only real settlement was Jamestown. He spent his first night here in the same building that Arthur Wellesley, the man who would go on to defeat him at Waterloo, had stayed in over 10 years previously on his way back from India. Napoleon was not impressed. It is an unlovely place, he said bitterly. His captors wanted to find somewhere where the military could keep an eye on him. Napoleon himself settled upon a pleasant pavilion called Briar's House. The happiest times Napoleon had during the whole of his exile on this island were spent in that house there. He became great friends with the Balcom family, particularly bonded with their small daughter. He used to wrestle her on the floor. But the reality of his new situation could not have been more stark because towering above that house on that gigantic lava-formed cliff was High Knoll Fort. One of the most impregnable and impressive fortifications I have ever seen. It was built in the decades uh, before Napoleon took up residence here. And the garrison up there, with their guns looking down on this valley, would have made it abundantly clear to Napoleon, whenever he looked up, that he was a prisoner of his Britannic Majesty. He was eventually taken inland to a more secure, also more private and spacious house. This is Longwood. It was to be Napoleon's home for the rest of his life. I was shown round by the honorary French consul, Michel Danquan Martineau. Michel, how are you? Okay. It's an honor Welcome to be to here. Longwood. Thank you very much. I can't wait to have a look round. Yeah, You've meticulously reconstructed what it was like when Napoleon was here. Yes, so we have uh, uh, redesigned it. Uh, we, we use all the plans and all the descriptions and all the archaeological uh, uh, research for uh, reshaping to as it was in uh, 1821. The day he died. The day he died. 
And so what about these trees? Some of them look quite old. Would Bonaparte have looked out on so these trees? They were here on uh, those two, uh, two umbrella cypress were here because you can still see them on the, on the pictures of the time. Did Napoleon live a, a kind of rustic life or, or did he keep the etiquette of the imperial court? Going? So definitely Napoleon is always fighting his case of being a, a prisoner uh, of state and not a prisoner of war, uh, which was denied to him. So of course, look in, within his ho uh, household, he put the protocol in a higher level than he ever been. He never been as gastronome uh, that when he was on Saint Helena, normally when he was emperor, uh, a, a food for him uh, was a very something that goes very quick and is not very protocol. Uh, but here, oh la la, the food had to be the best. The thing. So he, he never cared more for food and uh, uh, etiquette than when he was on the island because he had a point to prove. Here you have the bathtub. Uh, so that is where he spent uh, a few hours a day. He spent a few hours a day in the bath. Yeah. So he sat here, but he can he carry on all his uh, activities like reading or uh, writing and so on. The life never stopped uh, because of uh, just taking baths. Napoleon tried to keep himself occupied at Longwood House, but his health was in sharp decline. After six years on Saint Helena. The man who'd ruled over the biggest European empire since the Caesars died in this room on the 5th of May, 1821. He was just 51 years old. There are so many stories surrounding Napoleon's death and, and conspiracy theories. What, what, did he, what did he die of? The autopsy has been done by the British doctors and the French one. Uh, so they all, it's quite an agreement. So uh, we have, uh, they find that his, uh, his in, uh, his stomach was uh, perforated, his intestine was in bad state, his liver was uh, uh, dangerously damaged. So they were nothing, uh, uh, it, it, the, the most surprise was actually he lasted that long. So is this where he was laid out in state? Yeah, so this room was uh, how it used to be on the 6th of May, the following day of his death, after the autopsy had been done in the billiard room. Uh, so after the autopsy, they laid out, his, they put his uniform. This room was uh, a, a display room for his body between the 6th uh, the 6th uh, of May uh, 1821 uh, to, the 8th, uh, to the 8th of May where the body was dis were displayed and then of course on the 9th of May the funeral. So, so Napoleon had access uh, to, to books, to maps, he wasn't restricted by, by his British jailers? So of, officially, yes, he had to, uh, to be censored of whatever he received. And then it's uh, very important that uh, at, on those days, the uh, uh, opposition of the Lord Liverpool uh, Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister by, uh, of the time uh, was Lord Holland. So he was on the Whig party and he was officially against the idea of sending Napoleon on St. Helena. Because he's more, he, he, you'd say now, liberal or progressive. Yes, yeah. progressive. And he was also, uh, so he was totally following the idea of Napoleon being a prisoner of state. Uh, so then, of course, his wife, Lady Holland, kept sending Napoleon's books. And of course, you don't open, you, 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 you will not deny that right to the opposition leader. So then Napoleon received a lot of books, uh, and it's very, but from the British uh, people, uh, but through the uh, opposition. So, and then it, it put everything into perspective. That's actually the, uh, the, the jailer were British, but the best supporter were British. There's something so poignant about Napoleon's time here in Longwood House, his exile on St Helena. He spent his days 
writing in those rooms over there, blaming everybody else for his mistakes and misfortune. And when he wasn't doing that, he busied himself around this garden, making the improvements that we can see today. But there's something bizarre about him and one of his key staff members, General Bertrand, men who had led victorious armies from Portugal to Moscow, busying themselves and making small improvements in this garden, like creating this pond in the shape of Napoleon's iconic hat. What a fall from grace. Napoleon was buried here in a site chosen by himself. Europe's royal heads could rest easier on their shoulders. But today, it's empty. Napoleon's story was far from over. Great men can be as powerful dead as they are alive. In 1840, a resurgent French state asked that Napoleon's body be returned. 43 men dragged the one-ton coffin down to the harbour. It was the start of a journey that would see him entombed in the heart of Paris. The gravesite was picked clean by souvenir hunters. Even the twigs from the trees and the topsoil were stolen away. Appalled, the French government bought both the gravesite and Longwood for vast sums. Napoleon was one of the greatest soldiers and statesmen in the history of the world. That his last years were spent on this wild, remote and beautiful island only adds to the fascination of his story. His legend has ensured that this little island is famous the world over. St. Helena's military and strategic importance predates Napoleon's arrival on the island by over 300 years. In 1502, Portuguese seafarers first used it as a place to pause, refill fresh water and collect edible fruit and vegetables. So vital was it that it was kept a secret for decades. Portugal's hidden trump card in the struggle to control the spectacularly lucrative trade with the East. Eventually though, the English, Dutch and French found out. In 1657, Oliver Cromwell granted the East India Company a charter to govern the island. Planters and a small military presence followed and it became one of Britain's first colonies. But the Dutch East India Company had other ideas. They wanted to control the island to protect their growing trade routes and they seized it by force in 1672. The British struck back a year later. They sent reinforcements and reclaimed the island. The British had learned their lesson. They now knew that if they wanted to keep St Helena, they would have to protect it. The Dutch invasion 1672 stroke 73 prompted this massive um, increase in construction. So we'll find on the lee side of the island, almost every valley is actually fortified. If it's not fortified, you'll find you have lookouts either side of it. So nobody could come to St Helena after the Dutch invasion and actually land. Looming 600 metres over Jamestown is the imposing High Knoll Fort, a second line of defence if invaders made it onto the island. On top of here were six cannons. So originally six cannons were on top of the Round Tower. And um, the eventual construction um, of this uh, size was to actually um, house military personnel if coastal fortifications failed. And that's why this is so extensive. It could house a lot of military personnel. The west of these walls, I mean, this is a statement of how important Salina was to the British Empire. This is a huge fort. It is, you know, um, it's, it's very extensive. And yes, uh, it, it, it shows how important um, St. Helena was to the East India Company up until 1833 and then the crown thereafter. Uh, one of the important things to realize as well, strategically, St. Lena was vital uh, until uh, the Suez Canal opened. And then they didn't kind of require this route any longer. And so St. Lena was almost dropped during that particular period. But pre that time, uh, we are talking about 
near a thousand ships calling annually. For a lot of people around the world today, the name St. Helena may not be that familiar, but when you come here and you see the scale of investment, the effort that was made to protect this island, you realize how important it was, a vital strategic asset. And the result today is a legacy of military fortifications, well, unlike almost anywhere else on earth. They took an island and they turned it into a fortress. The East India Company turned the island's natural defenses to its advantage. But there's one piece of military engineering stretching up from Jamestown that caught my attention. I want to see it for myself, but there was a catch. Jamestown, the principal settlement of St Helena, is nestled in this canyon between two mighty cliffs on either side. And on top of that cliff is Ladder Hill Fort, an imposing defensive structure. It had to be reached by a rope ladder until, in 1820, an enterprising British engineer dragged St Helena into the railway age by building a funicular right to the top. A wagon drawn by donkeys moving around a capstan way up there. Today it's been replaced by these stairs. It's known as Jacob's Ladder. And every saint and every visitor has to take the Jacob's Ladder challenge. The record is just over five minutes. I'm going in. <sighs> Three minutes slower than the record. <sighs> Apparently eight minutes isn't too bad, but let me tell you, I declined the offer of improving my time. There was another reason why the East India Company spent so much time and money protecting St Helena. And that was to protect the transatlantic slave trade. St Helena is over 2,000 kilometres off the African coast, but that meant it became a crucial stop-off for ships transporting slaves from Africa to the New World, known as the Middle Passage. After the abolition of the slave trade in 1807, the British Royal Navy began intercepting illegal slave ships crossing the Atlantic. But the liberated Africans weren't taken back home. Instead, they were dropped here on the shores of St Helena. Many were forced to live on this arid and hostile landscape called Rupert's Valley. Cramped together in unimaginable conditions, living in makeshift huts from the wreckage of broken up ships and without enough food or water to go round. Tell me about this valley, what happened here? So Rupert's Valley is quite significant if we think about the global story of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, St Helena is squat in the middle of the South Atlantic um, and therefore was the perfect ground for British naval vessels that had intercepted the illegal Portuguese slave trade ships um, for them to, to free the, the, the captured Africans that were on board. Um, so these liberated Africans, they called Rupert's Valley their home for a period of about 30 years. So the British didn't take them back to Africa? No. So they came to St Helena um, and between the period of 1840 and 1870, um, approximately eight to 10,000 of them unfortunately passed away on St Helena. 550 managed to stay behind and integrate into the community, but the remaining 18,000 um, moved on to the South and Central America and some did go back to Africa, but they moved on as indentured laborers. 
Now that sounds like a lot of people dying. Was that quite a high mortality? Was that just the nature of things at the time? Or was it because they lacked the food, the, the support, the medical services to, to live a, a, a quality of life down here? Yeah, so basically the condition on the slave ship would have been appalling. But by the time they got here, a third of them would have been dead. Um, uh, the remaining uh, two thirds would be sick or some would be dying. Um, but also because of the resources and facilities that were available within Rupert's Valley, they had one doctor to a thousand inhabitants. Um, and that doctor was also responsible for the daily running of the establishment. So yes, they were very much under-resourced. There was no running water in the valley. Um, and as you can see around us, it is quite barren and hardly anything grows here. Is there an estimate of how many of these liberated Africans, how many of their human remains lie, lie beneath our feet at the moment? Well, there's a, a guess of approximately eight to 10,000 of them lying here in this valley. Um, we've got two burial grounds and we're standing on the biggest of the two, um, which makes the site the most significant trace of the transatlantic. I think all too, all too often the Brits can be quite pleased themselves that they were the ones who uh, abolished the slave trade and then took, went to great efforts to interdict uh, those slaving ships. But this doesn't feel like much of a liberation. 100% not. Um, that's only a portion of the story. We have a way of telling history that makes us look good. Um, we are much more complex than that. And this story shows exactly how complex that was. Standing in this bleak coastal valley, surrounded by the remains of so many liberated Africans, it's hard to feel that this chapter of the slave trade has been properly acknowledged. What is the plan? What is the best way to remember these people? The best way is to lean on the descendant community. And if there is no descendant community, you act as if you are the descendant community. And that is something that's very difficult to do now on St. Helena in uh, economically hard times, um, where everything else, especially economic development, takes precedence over cultural heritage. Um, so we are working, especially collaborating with arts and local um, artisans on how we can incorporate these beautiful aspects of the site, including the knowledge and the history, the rich history that lies with it, into the culture of St. Helena. But also sharing that story with the rest of the world, because this is a story that's everyone's story. We still know almost nothing about the lives of the men and women who never made it to the Americas, but couldn't find their way home either. The few reminders we have of their past and their humanity come from the precious objects they were buried with. I find this collection of beads the most fascinating. All from one individual, so um, an, a, an older male. Um, I think there's about 1,700 beads total, um, which is the second largest amount found on any one individual. And, uh, they were found actually around the skull of, of this individual and um, formed a really elaborate headdress. Um, as I said, this was a male and it, and it, it possibly donated some, uh, denoted some kind of uh, chieftain or, or higher ranking member of society. So from what the material culture you found with these liberated Africans, what, what do we know about their lives here on St Helena? Uh, their lives are very difficult on St Helena. I mean, not only they just come off the slave ships, which were horrendous, um, they're now crammed into a, a fairly small valley in Rupert's, um, which was, is dry and arid, and, and they didn't have adequate supplies, they didn't have um, the resources to be looked after, and, and they're essentially living in makeshift huts, um, erected from broken up ships and ship sails. So life was incredibly harsh for them here. Um, and, and that is unfortunately what led to many of them dying. So we, we don't know names, we don't know anything about many of these liberated Africans, but this is, these are the only clues mm. as to how they might have lived. Yes, yeah, so other than obviously the bodies themselves, this is all we have, that, um, the only tangible assets that tell us anything about them and their lives and, and their lifestyle and where they might have come from. Um, they had it's, it's unlikely that they would have been able to speak English um, when they came here, so actually being able to tell people where they came from for them was, was impossible. Um, many of them had probably never left their own their village um, back in Africa, and so 
they're in this completely alien place, um, unable to speak the language. Um, so this is all they have. This is all, and this is all we have to tell us about them. St. Helena has also proved useful for safeguarding some of the British Empire's most implacable enemies. Zulus were imprisoned here. And in around 1900, a large contingent of Boers were brought during the war in South Africa. These Boer commando prisoners of war were brought here far from their homes and their families as the British went to extraordinary lengths to stamp out an insurgency that risked humiliating the world's most powerful empire. The Boers worked while they were here. They did various jobs, played their part in island life. Some even settled down, stayed behind after the war. As a result, as this cemetery bears witness, they're not remembered as hated foreign enemies, but as friends as just another one of those diverse groups of people drawn from all over the world who've come here and have left a mark on this island and its people. St. Lena's human history is short, but varied and complex. Decisions made by distant politicians, generals, merchants and bankers have all had profound consequences for this island. A speck in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, one of the most remote places on Earth. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.